Alright guys, what's going on? Welcome in. So Mel Kuyper just dropped his second mock draft of the offseason and in this one we're going to be breaking it down. Let's not waste any time. Let's jump right in. So with the first pick, Kuyper has the Jacksonville Jaguars going with tackle from NC State, Ike McWanu. So I think the big question here for Jacksonville is, do you want to protect your own quarterback and Trevor Lawrence, or do you want to get after opposing quarterbacks and go with a pass rusher? Mel has them going with Ekem, and I gotta say, I like it. I mean, just the, the, the thought, the idea of protecting your number one guy, the number one asset of the franchise and Trevor Lawrence is, I mean, it's not wrong, okay? You also have Travis Etienne coming back. He was a first round pick in last year's class. So not only will Ekem just help Trevor's development, right? Keeping him upright but it, i mean it's also going to help out etm okay I, I mean this guy's dominant in run blocking you could play him at left tackle pretty much immediately now I will say this, although the team has uh, Walker Little, he was a, I mean, he was a pretty high pick in, in uh, last season's class, and he has a really high ceiling, a big, big guy. Uh, I, I like Walker Little, it's just the injuries we kind of have to be a little weary of. I, I think you could take Walker, move him at right tackle, and move forward. The, the big question here is Cam Robinson. Will the Jaguars bring him back? He wasn't bad, okay? I, I know the Jaguars had some problems on the offensive line, Juwan Taylor and whatnot, but I look at Cam Robinson. Is he a top three tackle in football? No, he's not. Is he a top five? I wouldn't go that far either, but he's definitely not the bottom of the barrel by any means. So if the Jaguars want to bring Cam Robinson back, maybe go with the Walker Little at right tackle. Now, all of a sudden, you don't, you're not forced into taking an offensive lineman. But hey, if this is what the Jaguars want to do, they want to make sure Trevor Lawrence, uh, you know, has all the protection possible. They want to get as much talent on the O line. I mean, you, you can't, you really, really cannot go wrong. Next up, spot number two, Mel has the Lions going with defensive end for Michigan, Aiden Hutchinson. No surprise here, okay? And I feel like if the Jaguars do, in fact, go with an offensive lineman first overall, then Hutchinson will be the pick. Uh, it just makes so much sense. I mean, the hometown kid thing aside for a second, he fits the defensive system uh, beautifully, right? He fits exactly what Aaron Glenn wants to do. I really feel like the Lions need pass rush help. Although I, do, I did really, really like that uh, Charles Harris acquisition. I mean, he had a really good season, kind of came out of nowhere uh, for the Lions last year, but he's a pending free agent. Okay, tra uh, Trey Flowers could be a cap casualty. The Lions not only just need defensive studs, they need guys with high ceilings, they need instant playmakers, they need guys to not only just consistently get after uh, quarterbacks, but a guy who could just get in the backfield, right? Can you break, can you win one-on-one -on -one coverage? Aiden Hutchinson can do that, okay? So I think it would be a slam dunk pick, A plus for me. Next up at spot number three, Mel has the Houston Texans going with tackle from Alabama, Evan Neal. I mean, this guy presents tremendous size, really, really good power, versatility. He's played on the left side of the O-line, on the right side he's played tackle he could play guard I mean Evan Neal is not only just a really really talented player and arguably the best player on the board here but he's also a pretty safe player as well I don't really view him as some sort of boomer bust style of guy and he could very well be the pick uh, for the Jaguars at spot number one but for the Houston Texans, this is a team that has a lot of needs, okay? And you could definitely go with uh, KT here, right? Kayvon Thibodeau is still on the board. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, buzz with Kyle Hamilton possibly fitting into that Lovey Smith defense and being the pick at spot number three. Um, you know, but I, I think here, Evan Neal, it, it just makes a lot of sense if the Texans want to just go out and get a blue chip player, a guy, again, who you don't have to pigeonhole in one position. You can do a lot of things with them. It gives you the freedom on the offensive line. It gives you the freedom to trade a Laramie Tunsil uh, if you want to do that. He's a massive cap hit this season. Evan Neal could take his place uh, immediately. Okay, so I, I think this, I mean, it's really, really what it comes down to. The Houston Texans need talented core pieces on that football team. Evan Neal will be one. Next up at spot number four, Mel has the New York Jets going with safety from Notre Dame, Kyle Hamilton. Now, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I love Kyle Hamilton as a prospect. I do. I mean, the size, speed, years of production at Notre Dame, a true ball hawk, a guy who can make plays in the back end of the defense, but also can uh, come up and support the running game, not afraid to tackle. I, I mean, he plays my favorite position, safety. He is so much fun to watch. I love him. I really, really do. But my problem with this pick is Kayvon Thibodeau is on the board. Charles Cross is on the board. 
okay, I believe edge and tackle are more important as we stand right now. And I think it's easier to figure out the safety position and free agency and granted you know uh you know i don't i don't want to you know really come down on this pick because it's not like free agency happened it's not like the jets signed marcus williams and now he's projecting kyle hamilton to the jets or anything like that we still don't know what new york is going to do we don't know what safeties are going to be out there but man if, if the jets don't land a marcus williams if we don't land a jesse bates we can go out and sign a tracy walker from detroit a, a quandre Diggs, seattle seahawks a justin reed from the houston texans there are going to tart from the 49ers there are going to be options at safety through free agency and you could also make an argument that you could go and land a Jaquan Brisker in round two with Daxon Hill although I do think Dax Hill might bump up into the first round after uh, the combine this week but I think at the end of the day taking Kyle Hamilton would improve this team in a massive massive way I just don't know if safety right now is the bigger need over edge and tackle and a if it is that's one thing but b how how easy is it to replace edge how easy is it to get a a, a a cornerstone at the edge position or the tackle position i think that's a lot harder to accomplish than it is with safety so although i love kyle he's honestly one of my favorite player my probably my favorite player in this class I just, I, I think at four, with the talent on the board, it's not making as much sense as going with the tackle or edge, but that's just my take. Next up at pick five, Mel has the New York Giants going with defensive end from Oregon, Kayvon Thibodeau. I love this, right? Size, speed, production, three straight years of constant production, wrecking the Pac-12 uh, back at Oregon. He's an explosive player. He, he provides scheme versatility. He can play uh, as a, more of a stand-up role in a 3-4. He can play with a you know hand-in-the-dirt style of guy in a 4-3. I, I think he still has so much room to get better as a player. Now, of course, there is some smoke as far as you know uh, adding weight, adding adding mass to his frame that's definitely doable that's not I don't, I don't I personally don't think that's the biggest deal in the world especially considering we are in March March 1st right we're not a week away from training camp starting or anything like that that is not a problem at all and then there has been some buzz uh, as far as overall fire uh fire for the game that's the word that keeps being thrown around does he play with enough fire or less fire than um you know other prospects or other college football players and i think this week specifically at the combine kt is going to have a huge huge opportunity to uh, sit down and talk to these teams in the interview process and prove these people wrong and say hey you know what i really really do love the game of football so I absolutely love this pick. You look at the Giants' needs, offensive line and edge. They have two top 10 picks in this year's class. What are they going to do at seven? I don't know at this point, but they're filling a huge, huge position of need at the, at the fifth overall spot, and he's arguably the best player in this draft class. So A plus for me. Next up at pick six, Mel has the Carolina Panthers going with tackle from Mississippi State, Charles Cross. I love this. I feel like the Panthers uh, right off the bat need some more talent at tackle. Charles Cross, can he could come in and play right away. He's a plug and play style of guy. Absolutely fantastic in pass protection. Years of production against the SEC. I mean, he's faced some really, really solid defen uh, defensive lines out there. The Texas A&Ms of the world, the Alabamas of the world, uh, Auburns. So, I mean, the SEC West is loaded at D-line, and Charles Cross is, you know, continuing to uh, continuing to impress. I, I think right now Carolina has that big uh, question mark at quarterback. You know, say, is Sam Darnold really the answer? Is Cam Newton going to be brought back? Is PJ Walker? The answer, I think I'm going to say no to all three of those guys. So the Panthers have got to figure something out. There has been uh, some small rumblings that uh, the team reached out to the Vikings for Kirk Cousins. So I do feel like the Panthers are going to be one of those teams that is an, that is is aggressive in trying to acquire one of these veteran star quarterbacks, whether it's a Deshaun Watson, a Russell Wilson, an Aaron Rodgers, who knows, uh, maybe a Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, obviously, they again, Kirk Cousins is in the mix, but um, I, I really feel like Cross is not only just a safe player, a good player, but he's coming in at a position of need as well. Next up at seven, Mel has the Giants going with linebacker from Utah, Devin Lloyd. And Lloyd is a guy who can come in and play right away. Okay, I look at this Giants team, although they didn't win a lot of games, although they did have the Joe, uh, the Joe Judge fallout and they are picking in the top 10, 
when you're just looking at names on paper, this is a team with a ton of talent. There's a lot of talent here. Offensive playmakers, they have some star players on defense. Uh, although there might be some cap casualties, I look at the Giants right now as one of these teams that can instantly flip the switch and possibly make a run at, the, at that division next season. Uh, I, I really do believe that, okay? So Devin Lloyd is a guy who can contribute from day one. He's a tackling machine. I mean, eight sacks over, I think he had uh, 111 tackles this past season with the Utes I mean you take a look at his career numbers his career stats with with Utah they're almost video game-esque I mean this guy's all over the field he can drop back in coverage uh he's a multifaceted guy he's not some slow linebacker where he just like chugs along he can really only help out in the running game and that's really it no Devin Lloyd again is a multi-talented guy um you know I I, I think is it, you know I really ask the question here is linebacker the biggest need I, I don't think so. I, I personally, if I'm here and I'm the New York Giants and I, I select the Thibodeau fifth overall, I think I would go with Linderbaum uh, at seven. You know, I know it might be a little high for center, but... I think Linderbaum, uh, much like Devin Lloyd, is an immediate plug-and-play guy, and he's going to do a lot of really, really good things for that Giants uh, interior of the offensive line. But uh, hey, Devin Lloyd, he's not some horrible prospect by any means. I'm not shocked at this. I'm not stunned that Devin Lloyd, you know, in this situation would be a top 10 pick. So uh, it, it's solid for me. Next up at pick eight, Mel has the Atlanta Falcons going with corner from Cincinnati, Ahmad Gardner. I love this. I love this. I think the, the Falcons right now need some more talent at the cornerback position. AJ Terrell is just the man. I mean, he really solidified himself as one of the top corners in football. The guy had an unbelievable year. I mean, if you're a Falcons fan, you got to be pumped up. I mean, you really, really do. Um, you know, now, now that really the question here turns to the cornerback position, right? If they want to target corner, who do you go with? Do you go with the Derek Stingley? Do you, do you go with Gardner? Do you want to maybe try to trade back and land a McDuffie or something like that? An Elam from Florida? You know, there are a lot of capable corners in this class, but, you know, Gardner is a guy who is seeming, who really, really seems to be climbing everybody's boards. I, I feel like almost every single mock draft that I look at these days, he's in the top 10, whether it's to, you know, the Jets, uh, the Panthers at six, the Falcons here. I mean, or even, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of teams that Gardner is like linked to. And, it, you know, if he's not going top 10, he's going immediately after, like to the Minnesota Vikings uh, and whatnot. But man, I, I think if the Falcons here can land a day one starting corner, a guy with, uh, you know, number one potential, number one corner potential, and you're lining him up right next to AJ Terrell, uh, I think it could be, I think it could be devastating for years to come. And that's what, that's what's so exciting about it. I mean, Gardner, he's an aggressive player. He's not afraid to come up and tackle, uh, never allowed a touchdown in his career. Okay. So that, I think that says something I love. I absolutely love the Falcons coaching staff. Dean Pease at DC. I think, I think he, I mean, he's been around the game for so long. I, I think having two young cornerbacks in Terrell and, and Gardner would just be so electrifying, so electrifying for the fan base. Next up at nine, Mel has a trade, actually. Okay, the Cleveland Browns are moving up with the Denver Broncos here. The trade uh, compensation was not included. So all we know is that the Broncos are moving backwards and the Browns are coming up. And they're selecting wide receiver from USC, Drake London. Now, I look at the Browns right now. I don't really feel... Like Stefanski's offense uh, really puts a lot of emphasis on the wide receiver position. I mean, obviously it's built through the offensive line, it's built through the running game and play action. But man, I look at I look at the weapons that Baker Mayfield has at his disposal right now. We all know what happened with OBJ. Jarvis Landry might be released. Uh, cap casualty. I think the Browns need to get big big wide receivers, not guys that are like five foot 11 six foot i think london checks that box of being a six foot five guy i actually really really like this now again the, the trade compensation is not included so you know if the if the browns have to give up a first next season then uh, i don't know you know, I don't know if it, it would be worth it or if they have to mortgage, you know, a second round pick and a third round pick or something like that. But as far as just, you know, when I'm just looking at London to the Browns, I think it makes a lot of sense. I really do. I'm just picturing Baker Mayfield, you know, just uh, just getting these huge gains with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt in the running game and then him pulling it back on a bootleg and just firing it over the middle of the field to uh, to London. Huge catch radius can really do a good job and be a big target, uh, a literal target for Baker Mayfield in the passing game. Uh, and he also he becomes an instant red zone threat. Uh, this 
uh, offense really puts a lot of weight on the tight end position, but now you have a guy on the outside that possesses a similar size, right? A similar size to a tight end, but now all of a sudden he's on the perimeter, okay? That can also beat you uh, over the top. So you got to take him into account, Drake London to the Cleveland Browns. And last but not least, at pick number 10, Mel has the New York Jets going with center from Iowa, Tyler Linderbaum. I love Linderbaum. And when I think about Linderbaum on the New York Jets specifically, I think it makes a ton of sense. Connor McGovern is a 10.3 uh, $10 million cap hit for this season. I think Linderbaum would come in and be an upgrade over McGovern. Now, all of a sudden, if you do draft a Linderbaum, you can move Connor to right guard. I mean, A, you can either part ways with him, try to trade him, land something, you're clearing cap, or you can move him over to right guard and kill two birds with one stone you're now fixing center and right guard or, or really upgrading at center and right guard okay now you do in this situation still have to worry about tackle but avt is going to be left uh, left guard you have makai becton coming back from injury maybe they could bring back a morgan moses or something like that or target a highly ranked offensive lineman in the second round but even that's a little debatable but uh man linderbaum he fits the system he does a lot of really really good things uh moves well in space he can pull well i love love Linderbaum to the Jets but here's my here's the issue okay they because they went with Kyle Hamilton at spot number four uh, again this is pre free agency this is pre you know blockbuster trade anything like that what's happening at tackle what's happening at edge what's happening at wide receiver these are huge positions of need huge positions okay and there there there's some there's capable players here Jermaine Johnson Garrett Wilson okay there I mean, there, there's talent here on the board. So I like Tyler Linderbaum a lot. And if these two picks are made by the Jets, at, you know, on, on day one of the NFL draft, uh, would we be getting better as a, as a football team? The answer is yes, of course. But are we maximizing these picks? That's the question that has to be thrown out there. Now, I'm assuming, look, you know, if the Jets go with Hamilton at four and Linderbaum at 10, that's cool. If the Jets make noise at the other positions of need in free agency and possibly through a trade. Now, look, you know, if, if we land a DK Metcalf, uh, Calvin Ridley, and we don't have to worry about wide receiver and we go sign a Dalton Schultz and we sign. I mean, the edge, edge position is weird in free agency because I look at some of these top guys. Are they really going to be going to teams that are picking in the top, you know, five in the top ten? I don't know. I feel like a lot of these guys are going to be trying to make a playoff push, signing with with instant contenders and everything like that. The Chiefs, the Rams, the Bills, teams of that nature. Uh, but hey, I mean, if we fill other needs and we have you know proven players here, I I, I understand going trying to upgrade safety and center with the two picks here. Um, but for me. I think I would have done it differently. I got to be honest with you. If I was Joe Douglas and the, the draft played out this way, I'm going Thibodeau at spot number four or Charles Cross. I, I think you can't really go wrong with either. And then that would obviously shake things up at spot number 10 because Hamilton would still be on the board. Uh, big rabbit hole there. But I, I, I think for me, it's not my favorite draft class. But at the end of the day, because the Jets have a ton of weaknesses, we would be getting substantially better. Anyway, let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. How'd you like this mock draft for the Jets for your favorite team? And uh, yeah, I appreciate you watching. Can't wait to see where you guys stand on this. And as always, thanks so much. Go Jets.